In some of our more statistical Lean Six Sigma tools, like t-testing or SPC graphs, we use a standard error, which is not exactly the same as a standard deviation. And the difference is important, although I think we can explain it in a relatively simple way. So let's dive in. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel, where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And this video's topic is the standard error and how it's used in some of our more statistical Six Sigma tools. Now, it is a pretty deep statistical topic, but I'll try to keep it as light as possible. And for the real statistics lovers, I will make a number of shortcuts. So if you are really into statistics, then don't take this to prep for your exams. But if you just want to use these tools in a correct way in practice, stay tuned. I'm going to try and get this topic into a way that we in the improvement community can understand. Now, it all has to do with telling the difference. And what we know is when we have, for instance, uh, a whole production, or we know that this line makes, let's say, 100 gram products. So 100 is the normal state for our production line. And we have a product that was 110 grams. Is this a problem in the line or not? So has the process shifted compared to 100? Now, some of you might say, well, yes, 110 is larger than 100. There is definitely a difference. But the more statistically inclined will say, well, that depends on how much variation there is in this whole product line. So if we see products that can be anywhere between 80 and 120, maybe 110 was just a normal value. But if usually it's all between 99 and 101, well, then this really is an outlier or a shift in the process. And the usual way that we handle this is by checking also with the standard deviation. And I think if you are following this channel, you will know this, this graph. So you have your bell curve with our three, or actually six sigma lines, and a sigma is a standard deviation. And in the example I took, we have a standard deviation of 10. So in fact, our one sample is one standard deviation higher than the average. And then we generally tend to say, well, there's a pretty big chance that it was just a regular product from this group. In fact, the chance that you get such a high value, I mean, it, it is in the 30% range. When we get a measurement that's somewhere here, so 140, well, that's already four standard deviations from the mean, that's probably really a different thing than what our process normally does. Now, this is using standard deviation to judge if one value is too far from our mean and if we should say that there is a significant difference. What now if we take a bit of a sample group? So we took a number of samples and many of those samples are within the range that if it was one sample, you would not say that there is a significant statistical difference. But if we add them together and we get a new mean, the mean by itself would be a bit on the border. We would probably not say that there is a significant difference if we would have one value here. But because it is comprised of a number of samples, this becomes much more powerful in saying that this sample group is really apart from the mean. Now, this is because the standard deviation is no longer used when we are talking about a group of samples and comparing it to another group. And this is actually also what a t-test does for you. So with a t-test, you take a sample of more than one and you compare it to either a known population. So this is a one-sided t-test. We have a sample of our to be tested products and we know what the normal population is. So that's basically what I made here. Um, a two sample t-test is when both the sample and the reference sample, so to say, they are both not references. We are just checking, is there a difference? And what it will do is it will also make a curve here, a bell curve and, and see if they are far enough apart. But now these lines, they are no longer the standard deviation. Now, 
let's get into this idea a bit in another form that I think uh, will enlighten a bit the, the thinking process. And that is when we use an SPC graph, we basically also say that there is a known average that we have of our production and we know the standard deviation and we made the upper and lower control limits based on that. This we get from a pretty big backlog of, of data about our process and the goal is to see the, what we are doing right now. Is it significantly different? And significantly different in a process control chart means has our process shifted? And there are a couple of rules and I will not explain all the statistics behind the rules, but you will feel that the first rule I mean, is, is really just a, st a standard deviation type of, um, of determination of a difference, but the other rules, they become more interesting. So what do we see if you have a point that's over three standard deviations? You say, well, that is a shift in the process. But what we more often will see, and that's a bit what I drew here also on top, is we have a number of values. You may or may not know that there is also one of the rules if within three consecutive points you have two over two sigma, then we have a significant difference and we have a shift in our process. But basically we are judging a group of samples compared to what we know the process has to be doing. So what was the statistically, um, let's say, controlled base of our process. What we will be doing here is saying this whole group here, just judging by the SPC rules, well, here it would have gone off track and we would have uh, alarmed. But if we are comparing this to our process, what we want to know is what is actually the mean. So the mean of this whole group we know that it's a level roughly halfway between one and two sigma deviation. So we have a 115 mean here. That by itself will not tell if it is significantly different or not. But instead of using the known standard deviation from our base population, we are going to do it based on how sure are we that the mean of this sample group is higher or lower. So really different from the mean that we know our process should be doing. And for that, we also take the standard deviation. So here we will also get a standard deviation of all these sample points from the mean, but we are not so interested in the standard deviation of the sample itself. What we want to know is how much can we trust this mean to be really here? So you can imagine that when you have a pretty big variance or a pretty big standard deviation in your process, but you take enough samples and they really fit a bell curve, so you know that they are normally distributed, after quite a, a number of samples, you are very certain about the mean value. Even though the spread around it will be big, you are very certain of the mean. And that is basically what we're going to do here. So what we're going to do is we take and this standard deviation, and we're going to divide it by the number of points we have here, but then by the square root of this number. So here, one, two, three, four, five, six points, we get the standard deviation of this sample set divided by the square root of six. And then we get the standard error. And the standard error, and by the way, this is the standard error of the mean. You can have all kinds of standard errors, but really for 90 or more percent of the tools we use within Six Sigma, when we're talking standard error, we mean the standard error of the mean of your sample. What this says is, how sure am I that this really is the mean of my sample group? And now when we know this, we can use, let's say our uh, our normal Six Sigma intuition when we want to have a confidence interval. So when you want to be 99.7% sure that you are making the correct call when saying that there's a difference between your sample and the overall population, we need to be, well, in standard deviation terms, outside of 
three sigmas from the mean. Here we have to be outside of three standard errors from the mean of our sample and the mean of our general population. So it's very comparable. And this idea is what a t-test does. Now, a t-test also takes into account a bit stronger your sample size. So uh, when you have a sample size of below 10 or so, it really starts to play around a bit with the cutoff points of calling it significant or not. But when we're going to sample sizes of 30 and higher, this is exactly what it's doing. So what a t-test does, and I think we can make the step quite easily now, is it says this difference between our mean of the sample and the mean that we know, this we call z. And we divide z by the standard error of this sample group. And then we get the t-value. And we compare it to a t-value table. And in a t-value table, you will see that if you want to have a confidence interval of 99.7, then you need to have a t that is higher than 3. Now, if you pick a low sample size, both your standard error will increase and the t-value needed to declare something, a significant difference, will also increase. So a t-test really penalizes you for taking a small sample size. But this is logical because we also know that if you just have one or two values here, we would also not call it significantly different. And you also see how this t-test and the statistical process control and, and checking for difference, it all comes together. And that is logical because you are basically trying to do the same thing. So of course, the statistics that is trying to prove the significant difference is also very similar and it ties together. So this t value indeed, it uses the z value that we know also from Six Sigma. We, we often talk about a z shift, which is how much is the average of our latest sample group shifting from our known average of the process. And is this still within the bounds that we expect as normal variation or not? If the standard deviation uh, is relatively high, then it's difficult to detect a smaller Z shift. And if we have a very stable process or a lot of uh, measuring points that are very close together, then we can detect a small Z shift. So all these things, they all come together again. Now, I feel I should say that this is a bit of a special case. And uh, the reason why probably this topic is more difficult to learn from a statistics video statistics channel is because we are using the standard error of the mean and that's basically the only version where you are allowed to use this simple formula. For the rest, you, you really have to just take a number of samples and do all kinds of calculations with that. But within our Six Sigma toolkit, the standard error of the mean is the one we almost always use. So I hope that this makes this pretty in-depth statistical topic more easy to grasp because I think we should know a bit of the basic statistics behind the tools that we use in order to, to use it correctly. Even more important to know when we are running into the, the limits of when the tool can still be used. And that's also very important because when we do our analyses and we present it to management, they will assume that we did our homework and that we made the correct assumptions and calculations and took into account the statistical limits of the tools that we are using. So I hope this was a valuable lesson to you. If it was, don't forget to hit that like button and also let me know which other statistical or other topics you would like me to cover about our continuous improvement world. For now, I wish you the best of luck with statistics, with your statistical process control, but also as always, enjoy the work itself.